spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Lord, let my words heal a heart. I want to spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life mending broken Hello and welcome to 3ABN Today Live. We're coming to you live from Studio A right here in Thompsonville, Illinois. And tonight we have a very serious topic, but a very interesting topic, and it's something that we need to hear. We're going to talk tonight about the 500 years from Luther and the final, Earth's final crisis, what's coming up. You know, it's amazing to me to think that over nearly 500 years ago, October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis about what he was concerned about, the abuses of the church, to the door of the Wittenberg church. And he didn't realize what he was starting and it spread like wildfire. But what we're seeing today is that the ecumenical movement is trying to reverse the Reformation. And so we'll be talking about that tonight with our special guest. Let me just go ahead and introduce him because I can't wait to do that. And it is Pastor Steve Wahlberg, who is the speaker director of Whitehorse Media. Steve, welcome to 3ABN Today Live. Yes, thank you, Shelley. It's always good to be with you. And this is the first time we've actually done a live program together. So I'm thrilled. I am too. We've done a lot of interviews we together, have. but this is our first live. That's right. I wanted to open up tonight with a scripture that you'll see why in, in a little while. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. And Paul's talking about false apostles and deceitful workers who transform, them, transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And he says, for no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministry, his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. That's a powerful statement. It's something that we'll unpack in a little while. Before we begin, we want to talk about, well, first I just want to say thank you Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and your financial support of 3ABN. But we're going to have some music first, and this kind of get us going. It's somebody who's very near and dear to my heart, Tammy Chance. That's Danny's sister. She's the best thing that came out of the Shelton family. <laughs> and she has, um, she's got a pure voice, and she has always used it for the Lord. She's going to sing for us, He Will Carry You. There is no problem too big God cannot solve it There is no mountain too tall He cannot move it storm too dark God cannot calm it there is no sorrow too deep he cannot soothe it
Beautiful song, mm -hmm. pure voice from a pure heart. That was Tammy Chance. Well, if you're just joining us, our special guest tonight is Pastor Steve Wahlberg, who is the speaker director of White Horse Ministries. And this is live. We debated, didn't we, Steve, whether or not we should take questions tonight. But if we had said yes and had you calling in, we'd probably only got to two or three of those questions because he came armed with a lot of information. So it's going to be a fast-paced program, I think, and it's, it's going to be it exciting. Yep. Um, I wanted to mention we do not have a free offer tonight, but Whitehorse Media is making a special offer. And there are five of their pocketbooks, I guess we would call. Correct. For the 500, the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation, five books for $5 right. plus a bonus book. Yep. And these books are The Vanishing Protestant, The Antichrist Identified, The Coming Judgments of God, I haven't read that one yet, Discovering the Lost Sabbath Truth, Decoding the Mark of the Beast, and Is God's Church Built on Peter? You actually wrote this last one when, uh, Right before, when we invited you to do camp meetings, That's right. exposing the counterfeit, Steve did a, a, a sermon on Is God's Church Built on Peter? And that's when you wrote that. So we're so excited that you brought those along and we'll tell you how to get those a little later in the hour. Steve, before we get into our subject, kind of catch us up on the family. Sure, uh, if we can put a slide on the screen of my son, Seth, and my daughter, I'm thrilled to announce that Seth was baptized uh, last summer. How old is he now? He's 13 now. He's a big teenager. Unbelievable. <laughs> and there's little Abby. She's so excited, and you probably missed her, but Kristen was in the background. She prefers to keep a low profile, uh, but the Lord has just been so good to me and my family, and I was just can't tell you how excited this father's heart was Amen. to go into the water, to baptize uh, Seth, and I'm looking forward to baptizing Abby in the future, and uh, God has just been so good you know, you and, and to us. He, he has. I remember when we first met, it was 2002. I wasn't yet a member of the Adventist church, but I was attending an Adventist church, and I actually attended for about 
mm, seven months, I guess, eight months before I joined. And when you and Kristen were newly married, no children, and so it was, uh, I've had the pleasure of watching Steve's family grow and just you all were meant for each other. God brought you together, no doubt. So I tell us that. what's going on at White Horse Media. Uh, uh, there's too much to tell, but I'll just give you the short, a short version. Uh, we are alive and well. We're moving forward. We have a team now of four associate speakers, including me, uh, or in addition to me, to help field all the speaking requests that we get. Wonderful. Uh, we just had a team come back from uh, India, uh, training pastors and their wives. And there's another outreach uh, being planned uh, in an unlocation, undisclosed location in the Middle East. We don't want to go into some of those details. Uh, and we've also been asked to coordinate uh, an outreach of 18 different seminars in the, in the Philippines coming up in 2018. So, and that, that's just a few of our projects. We have uh, books on the horizon. We've got web development. We just did a webinar on why all the disasters are happening, which is on our website. We'll and be talking we about got, that in the second yes, hour. Yes, and we've just got a lot going on, and uh, God is good that the ministry is still alive and well and going forward by faith in Jesus and in His power. Well, I know that you, sp you have a very hectic schedule, but it kind of caught up with you this year. Tell us about that. Yeah, and this is going to be the real short version. And you and I have talked about this over lunch today. And uh, this, the, actually, the story is on our homepage of our website, uh, whitehorsemedia.com. And I gave a talk on this just a couple days ago. It was unexpectedly, uh, the door opened up for me to speak. And I t entitled my talk, I Can't Sleep, My Crisis, God's Victory. And just to make a long story short, this was the worst summer in my life life uh, for a variety of reasons and I, I don't understand everything uh, in June shortly after the camp meeting where I spoke here for the mm -hmm. 3 ABN spring um, counter countering the counterfeit uh, I started having sleeping issues and I, I lost my ability to get a good night's sleep and things got worse and worse and I started taking uh, start, started that with Tylenol and then a lot of melatonin and then uh, experimented with Ambien and then uh, Trazodone and then finally um, Lorizepam. That's and I went into a tailspin. I just went into a tailspin. I actually went four days in a row without sleeping at all. Uh, sleep my life, deprivation like my that life was make... falling apart. I was yeah. discouraged. Uh, the medications that I was on were uh, leading to depression. And to make a long story short, God opened up a miraculous door for me to go to Weimar Institute and to join uh, Dr. Neil Nedley's depression recovery program. Yes. And I spent three weeks there at Weimar and a series of blood tests were done and Dr. Nedley looked at the results from the lab and looked at my brain chemistry, which was really out of whack. And he recommended different supplements for, for my, uh, my head and to balance me out. And uh, plus a lot of uh, the eight laws of health. It's a very rigorous program at Weimar. And I went through this and uh, uh, I, I just can't tell you. I don't have time. It's in the story. The story's on our website in my hour long presentation. But I have never been so discouraged in my life. Uh, I was totally um, just, uh, I felt hopeless. I didn't feel like God loved me. I felt like my future was dark. I started having all kinds of different things happening inside my head. I felt like I was on the edge of, of my sanity, but by the grace of God, I held on to my faith in Jesus. Amen. And then when I came back from Weimar, uh, uh, Dr. Nedley helped to wean me off of the last of the uh, sleep medications. And about two weeks later, after everything got out of my system, one day I woke up and it was all over. It was gone. And that was about a month ago. And since then, I've been preaching and traveling uh, back, uh, back on the saddle, you might say. And uh, the Lord has taught me so many things that he is powerful. His grace is sufficient. There's nobody whose life is hopeless. Even when you think you're hopeless, it's a lie from the enemy. Amen. Uh, the battle is real between Jesus and Satan. 
And there's nothing that God can't bring us through if we trust in Him and in His love. Amen. Yeah. You, I'm so proud of you for coming forward to talk about this because sometimes when people go through anxiety attacks, if they go through depression, I think people worry that there is a social stigma attached to that and they don't talk about it often, yeah. often don't even reach out for help. Right. And I'm so glad that you are being transparent about this to show God's victory and what He's done in your life. But I hope you're going to write a book on this yeah, because I think, this I, think is I will. Needed. And you know, I debated whether I should even share this, but uh, God opened up the door just a couple of days ago for me yeah. to share it in my church. And when I was done, the response was uh, overwhelmingly positive. And it just uh, confirmed in me that, uh, that if I share this story and lift up Jesus uh, and try to bring hope to the hopeless, Amen. that God can use it to help others. Amen. And that's what it's all about. And so anyway, um, that's, the, that's the short version okay. <laughs> of my, uh, my difficult summer. Well, I know we've already prayed. We always pray before we get, begin a program, but I feel a need for us to pray again, sure. if you would please, yes. before we get into this topic. Yes, uh, for sure. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much that I'm here. Yes, thank that you. That you've uh, brought me through the trials of my life and that you are still with me and that you are, uh, you are about to bless. We pray that you will bless uh, the time that we spend here right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you were praying, I was thinking of Micah 7, 8. Where rejoice says, not against me. Yes, re oh, do not rejoice over that's me, right. my enemy, because when my, I fall, I will arise. Amen. That is my text. Amen. It's right on our, actually, it's right on our website. Praise That very God. verse. Praise when God. I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Amen. Praise His name. He always is. That's right. Well, Shelley, let's talk about Martin Luther. We've got a lot to do. Uh, I, I just brought a few magazines here that just to show you, I mean, this is the 500 year anniversary of the bang, bang, bang on the door of the Witten, Wittenberg Castle Church and uh, all kinds of news agencies and, and different people, which we'll talk more about, are remembering and commenting and talking about this. My son reads, and my daughter does too, Guide Magazine. Here's three articles in a row. Uh, issues in a row about Luther. Here's Signs of the Times, Martin Luther. Another Signs of the Times on Luther. This are all October. This is Adventist World, October 2017, A Reformation Journey. And Liberty Magazine, October 2017, 500 Reformation Years. So this is just a sample that people are talking about this uh, all over the world. And we want to go back to that day and talk about you know the context of how it how it happened and what the issues are and then we're going to fast forward down to our day and talk about the uh, continuation of the reformation especially during the final scenes of earth's history you know it's so important and, and we need to talk about this more than just on the 500th anniversary because uh, a lot of times as i am speaking with people if i mention that i'm a seventh day adventist and they say what is what is that and i say well we're protestants Oh, well, I think I'm a Protestant too. I'm a Baptist, but I don't know what Protestant means. And because people are not educated on the Protestant Reformation, we are putting ourselves now in jeopardy to have that Reformation reversed. So let's talk mm. about the context, about the monk Martin Luther, right. his life, his love for the church, and how God led him. Right. It's a story of a monk versus the Pope. Yeah. That's basically what's happening. Uh, you know, it's really significant to realize that uh, there is no human being other than Jesus Christ who more books have been written about than Martin Luther. Martin Luther is number two. Jesus is number one and Luther's number two. Uh, and what he did in, in the early 1500s literally changed the course of history and it is still affecting us today. And maybe we could just put on the screen the picture of him hammering uh, on the door of the church. This is really what the 500 year anniversary is about. Uh, it, it was on October 31, 1517, that Luther did this uh, famous act. And, and the context of what was happening really was uh, Europe at that time was under the control of the Roman church. And the popes had tremendous power uh, and they, you know, they basically uh, told the kings and the princes of Europe that if you don't go along with what we teach, you are out of the grace of God. You are out of heaven. 
you'll be excommunicated. And so there was a lot, a lot of power in the church's hand. Uh, Martin Luther was, as, as a young man, he started going to uh, studying law and then he got onto a horse and it was riding in a storm and lightning struck right near him. The horse knocked him off and he made a, a vow that if God brought him through this, he would become a monk. And he survived the storm, changed from law to, um, to the ministry and went into a monastery. And he went through his, mon his rigorous monastic training where he almost uh, killed himself trying to earn the favor of God. But he survived and he got through that and he, he became a priest. And then it landed in uh, Wittenberg, Germany as a professor of the University of Wittenberg. And right at that time, there was a man named uh, Johann Tetzel, who was basically a fundraiser for the Vatican. And he showed up in Germany, showed up in, uh, in, in Wittenberg, offering a piece of paper called an indulgence that the money would then help to build St. Peter's Church in Rome. And those who gave money for these indulgences would have all their sins forgiven and they would also be able to basically buy people uh, out of purgatory. And so a lot of the people, the uh, church, church members in Wittenberg uh, did that. They paid the money, they got the certificates, they brought them to Dr. Luther and, and, uh, and he said, I don't accept this. I don't accept these. By that time, Luther had been studying the Bible. He was growing in his faith. He was learning that the just shall live by faith, the famous yeah. Protestant uh, call, uh, cry, motto. And um, as the controversy was developing with uh, Tetzel, Luther finally decided to put onto the door of the church 95 theses against indulgences to create discussion. Uh, he really had no idea what this was going to do, the spark that this was going to ignite, the revolution that this was going to result in. Well, and, and we should say that Luther loved the church, he but did. Gutenberg had uh, invented the printing press not too long before he, this. And so when he, he wasn't expecting this to be published and so widespread, but the people got a hold of the 95 Thesis and they were fascinated by the thought that, oh, the Pope doesn't have total authority, the indulgences, all the things that he was listing, the abuses against the church. That's right. So he didn't expect it to really spread that far that fast. No, and it was really just designed to create discussion originally. Yes. And he was a strong, reform-minded Roman Catholic. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He had been through the monastery. He was now teaching in a Roman Catholic uh, university. And he had no thought that, the, that he was eventually going to leave the church. But anyway, as, the, uh, as his thesis began, theses began to circulate in Germany and throughout Europe, and it created such a stir of controversy that uh, as this controversy developed, um, you know, he, he became stronger in his statements about salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this is something that we need to stress, that Luther... Uh, came to believe from the study of the Bible and Romans, the book of Romans and Galatians, that salvation is through the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, eventually the rallying cry of the Reformation was the Bible only, faith only, grace only, uh, Jesus only. only, and to the glory of God only. Amen. And, and, and you know, I, I think that here's a point that's worth noting that Luther strongly believed in salvation by grace, not in human works. But at the same time, he opposed indulgences. And uh, an indulgence is basically the idea that you can pay money or you can do something, and then no matter what you do, uh, at least back then, whatever you do, uh, all your sins are forgiven. And I think, you know, today, uh, we need to realize that yes, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus and his merits alone, but that does not mean that we have an indulgence uh, given to us by God that we can then do whatever we want. Uh, we still need to surrender our lives to God and, and to mm -hmm. Jesus and by his power seek to do his will. So there's a, there's a balance in Luther's teaching that really helped spark the Reformation. Amen. You know, when you think about the the Rome, the Church of Rome was teaching that purgatory was a place where people went to have their, after you died, that this is where sins were purged, that you suffered and burned in purgatory. And not only were the indulgences either that they could 
spend less time in purgatory, or as you said, have all their sins forgiven, but they had indulgences that they were selling to buy their dead relatives out of purgatory or lessen their time, weren't they? That's right. That's, that was part of uh, what indulgences were supposed to do is to help lessen your time in purgatory or eliminate it entirely. Yeah. And, and Shelley, here's just another point that, uh, you know, as we've talked a little bit about my struggles and you shared with me earlier today during lunch some of your struggles too. The physical uh, struggles. You know, and I think about Luther's struggles and it seems mm -hmm. to me that God uses struggles. He Amen. uses Amen. trials. He uses crisis. Luther, Luther struggled and finally he discovered the grace of God. Amen. And what I've been through has, uh, has re-emphasized uh, in my soul my uh, oh, total sure. dependence upon the grace of Jesus. And we all need to understand that. We need God's grace. We need His love. We need His power. And we need His truth. Amen. And uh, you know, as we continue on with the subject, there's another big point that needs to be brought out. And that is this, that the Reformation was not just built upon uh, the doctrine of the authority of the Bible and justification by faith in Jesus apart from works, but there was a second pillar of the Reformation and that had to do with Bible prophecy. And what happened historically was that uh, as the indulgence controversy got, got you know, more intense, as it heated up, eventually in uh, 1520, three years after Luther went bang, 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 uh, the Pope issued a bull, what's called a papal bull against Luther. Which is a decree. And essentially the bull said, you've got 60 days to, uh, Rec to re recant. And if you don't, you're excommunicated and you're, you're gonna die. You're probably gonna die. And excommunication in the Catholic Church means that you're because out. they believe that Salvation is only through the church. That's so right. if you're not in the church, That's you're right. not that saved. That means you are out of, uh, out of the church and you're out, out of, of heaven. heaven. That's right. So it was a, uh, it was a fearful uh, thunder from Rome that, that made kings and princes and nobles tremble. And so Luther uh, received this papal bull in 1520 in Wittenberg and he read it. And, uh, and, and, and another concept had been developing in his mind, not only that salvation is by faith, not through indulgences, but that the power that has been opposing him is uh, not, not only is it not from Christ, but it is, it is antichrist. And let me just read to you, I've got a book here, big book. I, I like history. This is called The History of the Reformation of the 16th Century. It's a classic by Merle Daubigny. This book has been translated in many languages, gone through many editions. It's just a, it's a, it's a textbook dealing with the Reformation. And let me just share a couple of uh, quotes here. It says, this is page 215, that when, when, the, when the Pope basically threatened Luther with the bull and said, you recant or you're dead, you're gonna be excommunicated and you're gone, uh, Luther especially began to study the prophecies, the prophecies of the Bible. And here he says, uh, it came at last, this is actually page 204, it came at last, the papal, the Roman bull. I despise and attack it as impious and false. It is Christ himself who is condemned therein. And then he said, I rejoice having to bear such ills for the best of causes. Already I feel greater liberty in my heart for at last I know that the Pope is antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Now that's a strong, uh, not politically correct statement, but that's what he said. And if you go on to page 215 in Daubigny's book, uh, it says here, Luther said, I will stir up the bile of this Italian beast, said Luther. He kept his word. In his reply to the bull, he proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. Uh, a holy terror seized upon people's souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. And it is a, it is a historical fact that the Reformation not only discovered Christ, 
but preached against Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And it was Luther's study and preaching from Daniel 7, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, about the little horn in Daniel, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians, the beast in Revelation 13, and the, uh, the, the woman that was clothed with purple and scarlet, drunk with the blood of the saints, sitting on, on seven hills in Revelation 17. Luther applied all these things to the papal power. And it was his tying in uh, prophecy to the papacy, that's what really gave power to the Protestant Reformation. And, and to clarify, Luther was not anti-Catholic. He was anti-papacy. He was anti-authority given to, uh, to the Pope above the authority of the Bible. That was the, the issue. And, and today, you know, people have forgotten that, that, uh, that Luther uh, not only taught justification by faith, but he taught that the, uh, the, the papal power was the horn and the beast and the woman of Revelation 17. The little horn that came up in the midst of the European nations, the That's one right. that came out spoke of with the boasting mouth. That's it. right. You have in Daniel 7, you've got four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon representing Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The Roman power had 10 horns and then the little horn that came up out of Rome. It was a little one, and, uh, and the Vatican is very small. It's the smallest country in the world, but it has a lot of influence. And Daniel 7.21 says that it would uh, make war against the saints. Daniel 7.8 says that he would have a mouth speaking great things. And Luther believed that the little horn represented the Roman Catholic Church, not the members, but the system centered in the authority of the Pope. And he believed when that. When you're talking system, we're talking about a a geopolitical system that was uh, not just ecclesiastical power, but temporal power, right? I mean, it That's was right. the combination of church and state is what had happened. That's right, because I mentioned, as I mentioned, the Roman church had such power in Europe and, and uh, it was feared by princes and kings and, and rulers that they better toe the line or else they would get excommunicated and be severed from God. You know, it, it is surprising to most people to hear this because a lot of times we will, and, and we've got some quotes I'd like, I've got a quote I want to share with you at least by the second hour, but um, Baptists, every, every Protestant denomination has long believed what Luther taught through continued study that the geopolitical power of the Roman church is the one uh, that is the Antichrist. And I can remember, Steve, when I was probably mm, t eight, nine years old, President Kennedy was running for office and he was Catholic. And all the buzz, all the buzz, and we, in, in I, I grew up in a New Testament church, quote unquote, that did not study Revelation. It was a hands-off book for us. I mean, that they did not study Revelation. Yet, all of the people that we knew would sit around and talk about the, the beast, the Antichrist, that the Catholic would be, you know, they were worried about a Catholic gaining ascendancy to the President of the United States be, because all Protestants knew that the Roman Catholic Church was believed to be the beast of Revelation, the Antichrist. That's right. And again, to clarify, this is not an attack on Catholic people. Luther was Catholic no. and he loved Catholic people and Catholic people listened to him and uh, appreciated his message. And, but eventually when, when, the, when the headquarters said, we're going to get rid of you, we issued the bull, which Luther eventually had a big bonfire outside of, uh, or within Wittenberg, you know, maybe right outside the, the, uh, the town. I don't remember exactly where it was, but he had a big bonfire. He burned the papal bull and he said, a serious struggle has just begun, begun between me and the Pope. And he, that's when he leveled all, all of his uh, weapons, his spiritual weapons of scriptural truth against the Roman church. And it was, a, a, it was the biggest schism in the history of Christianity. It resulted in uh, hundreds of thousands of people in Europe leaving the Catholic church. It was, it was the, the result was the, the Protestant or Protestant movement protesting against the traditions that had come in into Christianity through the Roman church. And that's what a Protestant is, someone who protests, Luther protests, tested, and eventually he severed all connection with the church 
uh, and he believed he was still part of, and he was part of the, the Church of Christ, but no longer part of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's really what the Protestant Reformation was all about, getting back to the Bible, getting away from traditions, and standing up for Jesus Christ and for His Word. So is it fair to say that a Protestant is one who believes in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ? A Protestant is one who believes in the Bible and the Bible only as our rule of authority and who uh, rejects the idea that the Pope is the head, the, the total authority of the one true church. Yes, that, that, that's correct. Okay. And, uh, and Protestant churches, uh, Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Mennonite, uh, they all believed for, for a long time mm -hmm. in the two pillars, that salvation was through Jesus Christ alone, through faith, by grace, and, and uh, believing in the Bible as the primary authority. And they also believed that the Roman papacy was the beast and the harlot and the little horn of prophecy. They all believe that. Uh, but recently things have changed. And now we've come down 500 years since the bang, bang, bang on the door of the Wittenberg Church, and some surprising things are happening today. Uh, if we could put a slide on the screen, uh, yes, there you can see uh, it was last October, Pope Francis traveled to Sweden for a joint Reformation commemoration with the leadership of the Lutheran World Federation. And you can see uh, a statement there from conflict to communion, Lutheran Catholic Church uh, commemoration of the Reformation in 2017. Uh, I have, if this took place in Sweden, I've got an article that describes all, all about this in Ecumenism News. And it says here that it's all about ending a conflict that lasted for 500 years. It is import, an important step and part of the process of reconciling the past and moving forward together. Mm. Now, it's not just Lutherans and Catholics who have come together to move forward together, but if we could put another picture on the screen about the Kairos Conference, uh, this, is, this is amazing. You can just see that briefly. Kairos means time in Greek. Uh, the Time for Action, 2017, United in Christ, uh, referring to the, all the world knowing that we are one. Uh, keynote speakers, you can see there, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo and Kenneth Copeland. And the conference there, you see the dates, is October 24 to October 26. And so that conference actually just ended today. It has been taking place in Kansas City. It's, uh, and if you look at the speaker list, which I've looked at every one of them, it's a who's who list of uh, very influential uh, leaders in the evangelical world that came together for this conference and in the Catholic world. And this is their press release. I've got it right here. Celebrating a year of destiny. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri Convention Center. Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Charismatic, Messianic, and Orthodox leaders from several nations are joining together at the Convention Center in Kansas City, Missouri for a roundtable discussion, worship, prayer, and importation impartation and they're referring to John 17 when Jesus prayed that we would be one. It says here the conference also celebrates the significance of 2017 for the church internationally recognizing a number of historically significant anniversaries. The first one is the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. So they're, they've picked this time to commemorate that, uh, that event plus the 50 year anniversary of the Catholic Charismatic Movement or Renewal Movement uh, the launching of that in 1967, the 50 year anniversary of the Messianic movement in 1967, and the 40 year anniversary of the Ecumenical Charismatic Conference in Kansas City in 1977. And it says here, the purpose is to celebrate our diversity, to come together and to help heal the wounds of the past. Mm -hmm. That's what this press release says. And I tell you, Shelley, this is just so amazing uh, that you have a whole host of movers and shakers within the charismatic evangelical world coming together, finishing today, the day that we're here in Kansas City. Here we are in, uh, we're in Thompsonville, correct? Thompsonville, Illinois, this little, you know, not so little, uh, television station where we're broadcasting this live and they were also broadcasting live but uh, our events are very different and and I'm sure that you know the people there are very sincere uh, 
and they're, you know, they're, what they're trying to do, I was reading some statements from Kenneth Copeland, and I watched his sermon about this, and he said, a divided church cannot heal a divided nation, and that we need to, Protestants and Catholics need to come together to help America, and he referred to the demon of division that must be crushed. And their motto is John 17, where Jesus prayed that we might be one. But as I've read John 17, uh, Jesus also said in verse 17 so that fine. we must be sanctified by the word of God and God's word is the truth. So the unity of John 17 is unity in Christ with each other in truth and in his word. And we must not forget the basis of unity. Is, let me ask you this. Isn't this also, I think you told me at lunch, this was the 100th anniversary of the Fatima. Uh, am I jumping yes. ahead? No, no you're, you're right there. And we can put that on the screen too, this picture. Uh, this is a, a Catholic publication and it says here, the title there of that article is Pope Francis Grants Plenary Indulgence for Fatima Centennial. So not only is October, the, uh, and this year, the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which they're celebrating in Kansas City and coming together to heal the, what they're calling the demon of division. But it's all this year is also the anniversary of uh, an apparent, and I believe it was the devil, that appeared to these three children in Fatima, Portugal, claiming to be the Virgin Mary. And the Catholic Church really uh, believes that the Fatima apparitions of Mary were from God. And they are honoring that this, this year with the Pope giving another indulgence. And as I look at that, I, I look at, you know, Luther fighting indulgence, indulgences. I see 500 years to this year, I see Protestants and Catholics coming together saying we need to, you know, put away our differences, heal the divisions of the past. And, and then I see the Pope issuing another indulgence for those who, uh, who go to Fatima and who pray before the Virgin Mary. And uh, the bottom line of this point is that Rome is still Rome. Rome is the same Rome that it was back in the days of, uh, of Luther. I have a Catholic calendar here that was sent to our office for some reason. And it's about, and it talks about Fatima. And here's just a couple of quick quotes from the calendar here. It says, um, Our Lady of Fatima in 1917, the first apparition, said, Pray the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war referring to uh, World War I. And here's another, another statement in the calendar that says, here's Mary, and you see a picture of, of a heart, her heart here. And this is again commemorating Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima, second apparition, June 13, 1917, 100 years ago, said, uh, Mary said, my immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. Now I tell you, if Luther read that, Martin Luther read this, he would, uh, he would do the same thing that he did in, uh, in 1517. He would protest that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, not through Mary's immaculate heart. We don't need to pray to Mary. And before you comment, let me just quickly, um, Rome still believes that Mary is a mediator. Rome still prays to dead saints. Rome still believes in purgatory. They still issue indulgences to help people get out of purgatory or lessen their time in purgatory. The priests still say the words and believe that they can change literal bread into the actual literal body of Jesus Christ, showing that they really have power over the Creator. They can create the Creator. Well, that was uh, something that Martin Luther just, he was ballistic on that point. Th they still believe in the supreme authority of the Pope and they still believe in tradition above the Bible. And essentially, Shelley, the bottom line is that the beast is still the beast. It's still the beast. And the Protestants and Charismatics and uh, you know, Orthodox and all these different groups who are coming together, they have completely lost sight of Luther and all the Protestants, their understanding of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, and 2 Thessalonians 2, and Revelation 17, that these 
symbols, the little horn, the harlot, the man of sin, mm -hmm. the beast, that these symbols refer to the Roman papal power, and it is still the beast today. The interesting thing to me is that so many church leaders could be deceived because Rome, if you read, may I d take two sure. minutes? Sure, yes, of course. We I got, just want to read fine on something our, on our that sequence here. Um, Rome is very open about their agenda. The canon law, that, that's what's laid down by the papal announcements, is absolutely, they, uh, they detest the Constitution of the United States. They detest freedom. Here's the, the Church of Rome denies the equality of every citizen and liberty of conscience. Listen to this. This comes from the New York Freeman, the official journal of Bishop Hughes. He says, no man has a right to choose his religion. Then the Catholic world in the April of 1870 said, the church does not and cannot accept in any degree or in any degree favor liberty in the Protestant sense of liberty. The Catholic Church denies independence of civil law from ecumenical law. In other words, you can't, it, the church, they believe that the church is the, the sole, uh, has the legitimacy, the only person that has the legitimacy to make laws and to enforce laws. And they say that in, in the keys of this blood, Malachi Martin said that the Catholic Church intends to be the religious religio-political ruler of the world. And he quotes a lot of things, but they believe that only the Pope can determine how you will act or what you will believe. Pope Pius VII in his encyclical, this is in the 1800s, but I'll get to something in a minute, said it was proposed that all religious persuasions should be free and their worship publicly exercised. But we have rejected this article as contrary to the canons and councils of the Catholic Church. So what he's saying is you cannot have freedom. Only the Pope can tell you what's good for you and what you must do. Then Reverend O'Connor, who was the Bishop of Pittsburgh wrote, listen to this, religious liberty is merely endured. It's merely tolerated until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic Church. So the ecumenical movement that um, I, I believe that Tony Palmer and, um, oh, is it, who is it that you just saw? One Kenneth of the speakers, Copeland. Kenneth Copeland and Tony Palmer. Uh, Tony Palmer was a bishop of the Episcopal Church and he was very instrumental in talking about let's heal this divide, let's heal this wound in the church. But how can they, when you look through all of the Catholic literature, basically they are saying we want to get rid of Protestantism, we're not going to compromise on any of our beliefs, the Pope is the one who has the right to tell you. How do intelligent people who have all of this available to them, how do they not see what the agenda of the papal see, the S-E-E, how do they not see what the agenda of papacy well, is? Yeah, uh, one big reason is because the Protestant world has lost its knowledge of Bible prophecy. Uh, as I read from Daubigny's book, it says that Luther proved from, a, from the revelations of Daniel and John in the book of Revelation, from Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, that the, uh, the Antichrist, as described in the Bible, referred to the papal power. And that was a view that was shared by all of the major Protestant denominations for uh, a couple hundred years since Luther, but they've lost that. Now they're looking for a future Antichrist, many of them after the rapture, then the Antichrist will show up. And so they've, they've lost their knowledge of history, they've lost their knowledge of prophecy, and so they, they're not looking, they're not looking for, uh, 
for what you're talking about. You know, they see the Roman church as an ally uh, for pro-life and an ally in, in a culture war, and, and they don't understand who they're dealing with. But the Roman Catholic Church knows exactly what it's doing. It's known this for a long time. And, and again, I do want to clarify that we're not talking about Catholic people. Luther was a, was a Catholic for, for a long time. And the reason why he protested, the reason why he stood up, the reason why he preached and was bold and eventually turned to the prophecy and preached the prophecies was because he cared about Catholic people. He wanted to help them to turn away from all these traditions and to focus their minds on Jesus Christ, on His grace, on His love, on His mm -hmm. power, and on His word, mm -hmm. uh, instead of all the, the demands of Romanism. I, I went to Rome one time in 1993, uh, and I still remember, Shelley, going to, to a church, a Roman church that was a tourist site, and I was at the top of a series of stairs, and I looked down and I saw old Catholic women uh, on their knees, climbing up the stairs in this church, and I saw their faces. They were they were grimacing and they were in pain, uh, and they were doing this because they thought that that would help them to earn the favor of God. And I looked at these women, and and uh, you know they could have been m m my grandma, and I just yeah. thought to myself, ladies, you don't have to do this. Uh, Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. He wants to save you by his grace. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't climb the stairway to heaven on your knees and expect to earn the favor of God. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And, and the need for the Reformation is very real today. And the Protestant churches that are, you know, the Lutheran World Federation and what's happening in Kairos, uh, the Kairos uh, event, they just don't understand, and here again is the statement that we want to celebrate our diversity and to help heal the wounds of the past. And that leads us to one more text before the break. Okay. Um, I, have, just, I, uh, my, my, I just want to throw sure. this thought in because we haven't talked, we've talked about the Reformation, and Pope Leo X was the Pope that wrote the bull. He That's was right. ready to have Luther killed That's when right. and burn him. Uh, he was ready to burn him at the stake. Um, Ignatius of Loyola stepped in. He w was was he a bishop? He I was believe. a Spanish soldier a so who was wounded in battle and in a hospital. Uh, apparently, had a revelation. Uh, and became a soldier for the Roman Catholic Church. And he founded the order of the, uh, the Society, Society of, Jesus, of Jesus, which is the order of the Jesuits. And the Jesuits became the army of the Roman Catholic Church to help uh, fight and counteract and ultimately destroy the Reformation. And the Jesuits are still very real today. Uh, somebody told me recently about a letter they received that said, you're on the short list because you are uh, taking a stand against the Roman Church. And this was a letter from the Jesuits. And, uh, you know, they're very real, they're very active, they're very powerful, they know what they're doing, and uh, they were the And it was the Jesuits that began the Inquisition. It was the Jesuits that, uh, the Counter-Reformation, it was the Jesuits. Well, the Inquisition, act, Inquisition actually started before the Jesuits. Oh, excuse me, they, well, they continued, they, uh, they, they, were they were the enforcers of the Inquisition. But the Counter-Reformation that came up which brought forward people like, um, on oh, my mind, um, Francisco Ribera and right. Alcazar. Alcazar, yes. creating alternative theories to the Protestant view that the papacy was the beast, putting the beast way in the future uh, or way in the past, uh, associating with Nero. These ideas through the Jesuits have worked their way into the Protestant world and they have replaced Protestant historicist theology that's which sees the papal power uh, as the beast. Now, can we put another picture on the screen here? I have uh, one last one for this uh, hour, this first hour. There you see Time Magazine, uh, the Pope was elected, uh, chosen as Man of the Year. On the left side, you see the Pope sitting with uh, a whole host of uh, Fortune 500 CEOs. And on the lower left side, he's speaking at the United Nation. Uh, we know that he spoke to a joint session of Congress uh, in September of 2015. Uh, on the right, top, upper right-hand corner, you see him with President Trump. Uh, you also see him above the picture. Uh, I believe that's with an Orthodox uh, man and he's, or a Muslim man. And there he's also with a Jewish 
a Jewish uh, leader uh, before the Wailing Wall, and you see him on the bottom right with uh, Kenneth Copeland and a whole host of, uh, of Protestant and charismatic leaders. And there's a verse in Revelation 13 which goes back to the press release that came out of the Kairos conference to help heal the wounds of the past. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, prophecy predicts, I saw one of his heads as if, as if it had been mortally wounded. This is talking about the beast getting mm -hmm. a wound. But then it says his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Uh, the deadly wound will be healed. The, the press release says that we're coming together in Kansas City in 2017 to help heal the wounds of the past. The press release lines right up with prophecy that the wound uh, that the Reformation issued and that the French Revolution issued knocking the uh, papal power the, the, the Reformation wounded it spiritually. The French, French Revolution at the end of the 1700s knocked uh, the papacy out politically, but that wound is healing, and Protestants are part of that. They're part of the healing of the wound that prophecy predicts would happen by coming together with the beast and honoring the beast. Forgetting they, the dark ages. And they, they have follow. forgotten who the beast is. They don't know who the beast is, and that's because of the Jesuits. And all of this history may sound shocking and politically incorrect, but it is fact. And it's worth sharing during the 500 year anniversary of Martin Luther going bang. And, and I just bang, have to bang. say, we're, we're running out of time in this first hour, but I just want to say something that to me, Pope Francis is such a likable personality. Yes, I agree, totally. He, he seems like a warm and sincere individual. And once again, we are talking about a papal system, a, con, a system of church and state that um, we, don't, we don't want you to feel like we're Catholic bashing because we're not. We're talking about history. That's right. We're, we're talking, doing what Luther did in standing up absolutely. for truth because we care about people. And because we're seeing that this Reformation it, people are trying to reverse the Reformation, not recognizing that they're about to get in bed with the enemy. With the beast. Well, we are down with the beast. We're down to the end of this first hour. We hope that you will stay with us. Uh, I wanted to talk about your books that we're going, that book offer, but we will talk about that in the first part of the next hour. And we will be discussing all of the signs of the times and all of the terrible events that have been taking place that tell us Jesus is coming soon. Join us. Hello and welcome back to 3ABN Today. We are live and if you can tell I am sleepy tonight but you're keeping me awake. <laughs> I was worried whether I would stay, uh, if I would be bright eyed and bushy tailed. But we are talking with Pastor Steve Wahlberg who is the speaker director of White Horse Media and we had a fascinating first hour talking about the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And in this hour, we will be talking about how Earth's final <clears throat> crisis, all the signs that everything is coming together. Steve, once again, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad that God's raised you up from your struggle that That's you right. went through this summer. And thank you for being here. Yeah, you're welcome, Shelley. And it's my, I'm just, I can't explain how excited I am. And as we talked about in the early part of the last hour, you know, I had a terrible summer. I didn't know if I was going to make it here to 3ABN, but God brought me through a h horrific crisis and showed His hand and His grace and His love. Amen. And, and, you know, really that's what this uh, program is about, is God's love and His grace and His power and, and His Word. And the reason why we're dealing with these straightforward issues between Protestants and Catholics in the light of the 500 year anniversary is to uh, point people to the Bible and to Jesus Amen. alone Amen. so they can find that grace and that love. They don't have to go to all these other 
uh, avenues to try to earn the favor of God. And I see you've got our little, our little books there. Those are pocket books that we're making available as a special offer. Uh, the first book there is The Vanishing Protestant. And, you know, we talked about the Kairos gathering, and then we've got the Antichrist identified that goes into Daniel 7 and the prophecies about the little horn and the beast. Uh, the coming judgments of God we'll talk about shortly. Uh, and the Sabbath and the mark of the beast, and then a bonus book uh, is God's church built on Peter. These are this is a 500-year anniversary package that we're making available. Uh, five books for five dollars plus another book, and these books deal with the issues. They deal with the big issues that uh, people need to understand today as we're getting closer to the final crisis and to the coming of Jesus. Amen. And I've read several of these and they're excellent books. I wanted to read uh, something because before we go to our song, just to kind of put a little in cap on the first hour, sometimes people will write to us at 3ABN and they'll say, why do you talk about Rome, the, the papal system? being the beast, or why do you talk about them being the Antichrist? I just want to read something to you from the Baptist New Global, March 14th, 2013. So this is a very recent article. Dr. Albert Moeller, who is the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, is quoted in this article as saying this. Now, this is a Baptist. He said, evangelical Christians simply cannot accept the legitimacy of the papacy and must resist and reject claims of papal authority. To do otherwise would be to compromise biblical truth and reverse the Reformation. And as we discussed in the first hour, it is people's lack of understanding or lack of study of prophecy and history. And I think you kind of, it's something that, you know, I, I came out of a church that believed in the rapture and, and all of those things. In studying my Bible, even though I wasn't a great student at that time, there would be scriptures that I would find that I would think, wait a minute, that just doesn't line up at all. So I knew something was wrong. I think studying history and understanding the church history together with reading the Bible was really critical for me. So before we kick off this second hour, <laughs> we want to invite <laughs> Tammy Chance back to sing for us. Tammy is just a precious Christian woman and just a, a dear friend. She's going to sing Unworthy.
Oh, thank you, Tammy. We wanted to kick off this hour with a scripture from Luke 21. And I'm going to start with verse 11. And it says, There will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights, and great signs from heaven. And then it goes on in Luke 21. I'll read verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming to the earth, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Does this sound like it was written today? It is mm -hmm. just that we see the things that are going on in the world uh, with the natural disasters. Let me just kick that off to you. Pastor Steve. It's been an amazing couple of months. And those verses that you just read show that there's going to be convulsions in nature, cataclysmic events that are going to happen that are going to be signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what those verses say. And uh, we have seen in the last two months an unprecedented uh, sequence of, of events. We've got yes, we you know, Hurricane Harvey and then Irma and then Maria. And we have two uh, major earthquakes off the coast of Mexico. Uh, we have the, the rattling concerning North Korea and the potential for a nuclear war. We've seen Las Vegas, and we've seen the fires that have uh, ravaged California, Northern California. And uh, there's an article on the screen from USA Today, storms, earthquakes, North Korea, and now the Las Vegas massacre. We have to wonder what's next. Uh, and I've got this article right here, and it talks about how people, it uh, says Americans are thinking about the end times, because this has been such an incredible couple of months, the incredible sequence of disasters back to back to back to back, one after another, that people are just thinking, what is going on? And, uh, and that's what this article is about. Here's another one from the New York Times, which is not a... Uh, conservative publication. Not at all. And uh, the, the title here is Apocalyptic Thoughts Amid Nature's Chaos, You Could Be Forgiven. And the basic idea is that because of the hurricanes, the wild wildfires, uh, the earthquakes, and all the things that are happening, uh, it says here, it feels like the end times are getting a dress rehearsal. And it, the basic idea is that if you're thinking apocalyptic thoughts or that these might be the end of days predicted in the Bible, we'll forgive you because, you know, it almost looks that way to us too, yeah. as liberal as we are. <laughs> uh, you know, that's the way the New York Times is basically saying. So they're, they're again talking about all of these uh, disasters that are happening and they're just coming one after another. Now here's another article, one more I want to put up about this. And this one is from the Washington Post. Uh, and it says, Harvey, Irma, Maria, why is this hurricane season so bad? What's behind the intense 2017 Atl Atlantic hurricane season? We've never had uh, hurricanes of these categories that have hit America in, in such a short period of time again and again and again. Uh, and so people are just, you know, their minds are reeling. Said, actually, Shelley, I just, uh, we have all these little pocketbooks. I just finished another pocketbook called Why Deadly Disasters that will be available in the next month or so from White Horse Media that has just some, some amazing lessons from the Bible uh, concerning these things that, that are going on. 
And we also have the Coming Judgments of God pocketbook that's in the packet that we're offering here. And that deals with what the Bible says about uh, judgments and disasters and things that are going to be happening in the world. And uh, there's a very interesting quote. And if we can go back, maybe we can, uh, maybe Summer, if you can put that same article back in there, Harvey, Irma, Maria, why is this hurricane season so bad? Uh, this article ask the question, you can see why. You know, why is all this going on? Mm -hmm. And people are speculating, is it this, is it that, what's going on? And this particular article makes a beeline to Pope Francis. And it talks about what Pope Francis thinks about these disasters. To our, and I'll read from the article, to our struggling politicians, Pope Francis offered some advice. And this is what he says. He said, climate change is happening and you have a moral responsibility to do something about it. And then the article says, the hurry, this hurricane season is undisputably a nightmare and it is an indisputable fact that climate change is affecting our weather. The fingerprint of climate change is on every storm, it's in every raindrop and a sunny day, it is a new yet untested and ill understood factor in the way our planet works. So here's the Washington Post saying the problem is uh, climate change, quoting the Pope. Now, before we go to our next slide, don't put that up yet, uh, I want to make a, a comment here about this Bible and then I'll tie these things together. Uh, you, you can maybe see here and I think they're going to, the cameras are going to zero in on this Bible. I brought this with me. Somebody gave me this old Bible a number of years ago because there's something in it that's just shocking. And I'm going to pick it up here and I've had to tape it because it's, it's falling apart. And it was, it was published in the 1800s. And on the inside, it says that this is or was John Newton Correll's Bible who died in 1901. He was a lay Presbyterian preacher. So this was a Presbyterian minister's old Bible. And this particular Bible has uh, footnotes in it commenting on different texts. And I don't believe that every footnote comes from God, but sometimes footnotes can be enlightening. And if you go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, mm -hmm. where it talks about the mark of the beast being enforced eventually upon, in the forehead, in the hand, upon all the people of the world, there is a, a footnote in this Bible. And this is what it says. It says, uh, a mark is submission to the rites and ceremonies of the papal communion. Mm. In their right hand, that has to do with active obedience to the papal power. Or in their foreheads, this has to do with outward profession of its doctrines and infallible authority. Mm. And the, my point in bringing this old Bible is to show that this Bible upholds the ancient Protestant position, which we have talked about, that the beast is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church system. So this, this is something our church teaches. This is not something new that we've made up. That's this right. is coming directly down church, the 500 years. Lutheran Church, Methodist Church, Lutheran. Baptist Church. This was common knowledge, mm -hmm. common knowledge. But as we've talked about the, the, uh, the Protestant world, the charismatic world, the Orthodox world, the Messianic Christian world by and large has lost sight of biblical, the truth of biblical prophecy about who the beast mm -hmm. really is. Now, let's move into the mark of the beast. Uh, we know from the book of Revelation that there will be a mark of the beast that is coming. And uh, it has eluded a lot of people that the mark is the mark of the beast. And so we have to know who the beast is because the mark comes from the biblical beast. And as I showed from this Bible over here, the, the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Lutherans, they used to believe that the beast was the Roman church. And if that belief still holds water, which I believe it does because the Bible hasn't changed. The Bible is still God's word. It doesn't change. And it's the only entity that meets all of the requirements that's right. listed all in Daniel the, uh, 7. That's right. And all the prophetic details. Mm -hmm. And so if the beast is really the Roman church, then the mark of the beast has something, it is something that comes from Rome. 
as the footnotes say in that Bible. And now the context that we're in today is we have all these disasters. Say that, are, that again because that mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, the, the way if the if the beast is who we're saying it is, right. the Roman church, so then the, the mark, mark of, of the beast, beast has to come. Is, ha is something that comes from Rome. That's Amen. right. So it's and, not, and that's what the footnotes say in this old Bible. And it's not some computer chip underneath your skin. It's something much deeper than that, okay. which, we'll, which we'll discuss. And so now here we have all these disasters which are being attributed to climate change. Uh, the Pope says it's because of climate change. And if we could put the next slide on the screen, Pope Francis has come out with what's called an encyclical. Uh, and it's called the C On Care for Our Common Home. It came out in June of 2015. And now, an encyclical is simply... Is the encyclical, word encyclical means a circulating letter. And it's a letter from, typically it's from the Pope to Catholics. But this particular encyclical dealing with climate change, the environment, and uh, the global solutions to these problems, this particular encyclical is addressed to all the people of the world. And in that encyclical, uh, and if has, you, has the Catholic Church ever done, has any pope ever done that before? Not, not that I'm aware of. I do know that no pope has ever spoken before a joint session of Congress. I know that. Uh, and I know that there are things happening with this present pope that are unprecedented. And, and if you could put that uh, slide back on the screen, thank you. Uh, right in his encyclical, section 237, the encyclical is entitled Praise Be, we have this statement. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So here's a statement from Pope Francis uh, dealing with climate change and the environment, which all these disasters are happening. You know, like I read, here's this uh, article from USA Today saying all these things are happening. What's next? And the other article saying uh, from the Washington Post, why is this going on? And they're saying, well, the answer is, the reason is because of climate change and the Pope's encyclical on climate change offers a solution. That and Sunday the solution, is the, he will heal our relationship with the world. With so. God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. It's a healing day that will help heal the planet. That's what Pope Francis is propagating in his encyclical on the environment, which is being read by uh, politicians and, and scientists. And, so uh, we are moving toward all the mark. around the world. That's right. Well, we have to get to, the, to that issue of exactly the mark, as, as I mentioned. Uh, the old Bible says that the mark has something to do with, um, with the Catholic Church. Now, if we can put the next slide on the screen, we know that the Pope is pushing for Sunday as a part of the solution to, uh, to climate change. And this particular uh, picture shows the Ten Commandments and then the Sabbath change to Sunday. It's no secret that the majority of Bible-believing godly Christians today go to church on Sunday. And there's a statement from a very famous Catholic uh, cardinal who lived in the 1800s, uh, Cardinal Gibbons. And there's the quote. He says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change, and he's referring to from the Seventh-day Sabbath to Sunday, was her act. And the act is a mark of her, her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Mm. Now, what that statement is basically saying, to you know, make it simple, is that the Roman Catholic Church claims to have changed, you see the Ten Commandments there, mm -hmm. over on my right, and you see the Fourth Commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. God wrote with his own finger, he wrote with his own finger that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Yeah. So. And that uh, it's, it's his holy day. And what the Roman church has basically done historically, and there's a lot of history behind this, which is all inside another little pocketbook there called Discovering the Lost Sabbath Truth. What the Roman church has done historically <laughs> is that they have switched days. And the, the rationale is the resurrection. Jesus rose, but mm -hmm. underneath the rationale was a desire to be more like the, the Romans, which kept Sunday, to be less like the Jews, who kept Sabbath. And there was a switch in history, and eventually the Roman Catholic Church took the ball and said, we've changed the Bible Sabbath into Sunday. And they, in that previous quote I put on the screen from Cardinal Gibbons, he, he basically says that...
the change of the seventh day to the first day is a mark of our authority as the true church of God. Amen. They say God wrote the seventh day, we changed it to the first day, and that shows that we are the true church. It's a mark of our authority. That's Over what the saying. Word of God. That's right, above the Word of God. Yes. And this was prophesied in Daniel that right. this little horn power would think to change the times and the laws of God. So this was prophecy being fulfilled. That's right. Now let's, let's go back to Revelation. Okay. And we're going to bring all this together. We've got the disasters. We've got the popularity of the Pope, his encyclical, him saying that the world needs to keep Sunday as part of the solution to global warming and climate change. We've got prophecy predicting that the, the wound, the deadly wound of the papal power would be healed. We have the old Presbyterian Bible saying that the mark of the beast is something that comes from the Roman Catholic Church. And then we have the Roman Catholic Church saying that Sunday is a mark of our authority. And all of these are, are facts. And so back to Revelation 13 tells us that one of these days, the mark of the beast is going to be enforced by law. Revelation 13, 16 says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no one will, may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so this, prediction tells us that the mark of the beast is going to be enforced by law around the world. Now, if what we're saying is not out in left field, if it's really true that the beast is the Roman church, uh, as Luther said, and that the mark of the beast is a mark that comes from Rome, which is Sunday, as Rome has claimed, then, and, and if the mark of the beast, according to prophecy, is going to be enforced by law, at some point, then what that means is that eventually uh, we are going to see uh, Sunday legislation around the world as part of the solution to climate change, which is at least the scenario that's unfolding makes up. that makes sense right in front of us. And so do we see, the question is, which I'm about to put a whole s sequence of quick slides on the screen, uh, the question is, uh, do we have any evidence today for Sunday legislation looming on the horizon. And there's a first, our first slide from the Associated Press. Uh, you see Pope Francis, and it says, keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. And basically the article is about how he builds his case that in order to benefit society, uh, we need to keep those businesses closed. There needs to be Sunday legislation in order to benefit families and society and the nation. Uh, that's what he's saying in, in that article from the Associated Press. <clears throat> now here's another article from uh, a, a European publication called the, Par the Parliament that says Sunday work is a danger to our health and safety. And that particular article talks about this whole coalition of people in Europe that are pushing for Sunday to be that. enforced by law. Okay, next, ar next article. We'll do these quickly. ABC News, German court enforces day of rest about uh, Sunday laws in Germany. Uh, next one. That's from Fox News, Fox News Opinion. Uh, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. And then here's another one. And this comes from uh, out of North Dakota. If, I don't know if you've been watching, but North Dakota has been debating about the old blue laws that have been on their books and whether they should be repealed. Uh, repealed. And this particular article talks about how uh, in, in North Dakota, in the legislature, uh, they decided to uphold those laws because we need to keep Sunday. We need to keep Sunday laws because people need to be in church. Uh, and so that's, that's recent in North Dakota. Okay, here's another one. And this is from The Guardian, Slow Sunday, The Simple Solution to Global Warming. Mm. Using Sunday as a day of rest and renewal would be good for our personal health as well as the health of the planet. So back, so back to the question, do we see any evidence on the horizon of uh, a stirring up and an agitation concerning whether Sunday should be enforced by law? There's no question, yes, we do. Uh, Pope Francis is pushing it. We see articles in ABC News, Fox News, Associated Press, uh, the Parliament, 
and uh, The Guardian, and the list, go I've got uh, articles in my files, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And that last one is very significant because it associates Enforcement of Sunday with uh, helping to heal the planet from, from global warming. And the basic idea is this, Shelley, that if, uh, if, if, if civil governments around the world enforced one day of rest a week, Sunday, and the businesses closed on Sunday, uh, that would cut down a, a great deal of carbon emissions and, you know, the use of fossil fuels and uh, pollution that would go into the environment help to heat up the, uh, the, the atmosphere, which would contribute to, uh, you know, hotter climate, hotter oceans, stronger hurricanes, and more of the disasters that we're seeing right now. So we can see the writing on the wall that the disasters and the leadership of the Pope and his encyclical and the whole climate di change discussion is moving us, and, and not just the Pope and the Church of Rome, but it's moving Fox News, it's moving the Associated Press, it's moving the major news organizations and a whole lot of other people, grassroots people, that are starting to see light in the idea that enforced Sunday observance would be good for America and for the planet as part of the solution to the problem of climate change. That's what's happening right now. And I see prophecy being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. We, we're seeing, first of all, all of these major lines of prophecy in the Bible have, are being rapidly fulfilled. People will say, how can, the, if the mark of the beast is Sunday keeping and, and enforcing Sunday, enforcing someone to worship on Sunday, and you can't buy or sell if you don't, people will say, I don't see how that could ever happen because Revelation says that the little, uh, the lamb-like power will make an mm -hmm. image to the beast. <clears throat> Here we're seeing it happen already. Um, it's coming to fruition in front of my own eyes. And we're seeing the Protestants reaching across to class pans with Rome. All of the things that have been prophesied are happening. So I would say that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, look up, your redemption is drawn nigh. We, you know, and it's so easy for us to talk about, yes, I believe Jesus is coming soon. Yes, I believe he's coming soon. Eh, we have a mental ascent until we get it into our heart that He is returning soon. I mean, we're getting ready. We are coming to the final crisis of the earth, last days, to a time of trouble like never been seen before. That's and we right. need to be ready for that. Exactly. And, and that's what this program is about. In the light of the 500-year anniversary of Martin Luther uh, nailing the 95 Thesis against indulgences on the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. Uh, and fast forwarding to today, the title of this interview is called 500 Years from Luther and Earth's Final Crisis. And I'm convinced that the basic issues that Luther dealt with in Europe, in Germany, and, and in Rome when he went to Rome earlier and then he stood up before the Diet uh, in Germany and all the struggles of the Reformation. It was basically uh, a struggle over authority. The ultimate issue was the issue of authority. The authority of the Bible above the authority of the Pope. That's really what the battle was. And Luther decided that the Word of God was above popes and councils and kings and uh, princes and rulers, and that no tradition, no tradition is above Scripture, the Word of God. And Jesus said we make void, he, he, he told the Pharisees, you make void the Word of God through the traditions of men. Through your traditions, men. yeah, Matthew 15. Yeah. And, and, this, and we're, we're dealing with the same issues today when we're dealing with the Bible, when we're dealing with Bible prophecy, mm -hmm. and ultimately when we're dealing with the Ten Commandments, the law of God, and the seventh day Sabbath, uh, we're dealing with an issue of authority. You know, the Bible tells us 
that God is the ultimate authority. Our Creator is the ultimate authority. And the seventh day Sabbath points to the maker of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it. And when you really study the New Testament, you also discover that, uh, such as in John chapter 1, verse 10, I love this verse, John 1, 10, yes. says, in the beginning, no, it's, I'm sorry, it says, he was in the world, talking about Jesus, he was in the world and the world was made by him. Amen. And the world knew him not. And that tells us that Jesus was more than just a man. He wasn't just a, a lowly carpenter uh, who taught on the dusty shores of Galilee uh, and, and grew up in Nazareth and was born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of ancient prophecies. But he is the maker of heaven and earth. He's the one that made this world in the beginning. He, the, the, the word of God, the maker of the planet became a human to reveal to us the way back to the father and the way back to himself. And we're dealing with an issue of authority. We're dealing with the issue of the creator. And when the Roman church says that they've got the authority to change God's holy seventh day Sabbath, which really is a day that reveals Jesus Christ as the maker of heaven and earth, they are really anti-Christ. They're going against Jesus. When they point to other ways of salvation, they're anti-Christ. When they attack the Creator's day, they're anti-Christ. And they, don't, they may not know it, they probably don't know it, but just like the people that crucified Jesus, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. And so we're, our world is moving toward a crisis and these disasters are gonna help bring it on, which are eventually gonna result in the enforcement of Sunday according to Bible prophecy, as a, so, as a global solution to a global crisis. And Shelley, when that time finally comes and the writing is on the wall, we can see the signs all around us. We can see the beast, his wound is being healed. We can see the uh, indications that Sunday legislation is looming on the horizon. When that time finally comes, that's gonna be the time the, the, that the Reformation uh, will continue 500 years, uh, 501 years, however, 502 years, however long it is until the Lord comes, that's the time when the Reformation is going to rise and speak with tremendous power through the preaching of the three angels' messages Amen. that are in Revelation. And so uh, if you have a comment, but before we wind this up, I want to zero in on the three angels' messages Absolutely. because they are the messages that continue the Reformation today. And make no mistake about it, uh, the Reformation is not dead. So uh, even though a lot of people are saying we're gonna heal the wounds of the past, we're gonna get rid of the spirit of division, the demon of division, we're all gonna come together and we're going to uh, unite and put away our differences as much as we can, that the Reformation is dead. This is just not true. The Reformation is not dead. It's alive very much today. The beast is still the beast. The mark of the beast is coming and we need to take a stand for Jesus Christ and the Bible above the traditions of men. And when we think about the people who are um, involved in trying to, the, who are involved in the ecumenical movement, who are trying to unite the world churches, I think personally that these people, you know, unity sounds like a good thing. Christ prayed for unity, but we can never accept unity at the cost of truth because the truth of God is, is far more important than unity and what Christ was praying for was unity within the church around the truth as we rally around the truth. That's right. I think these people are sincere hearted. No doubt about it. They, they believe that this is going to be something wonderful to unite, but they don't realize that they are about to close themselves in. We're crossing over a bridge to join the church. There's not gonna be any way back from that bridge because you have to look, history repeats itself. And because of everything that has been published by the Catholic Church stating their positions, it is clear that they believe that Catholicism 
is the only path to salvation. It is clear that they do not believe in civil liberties or religious liberties. They believe the Pope should have that authority. And if you look at the history of when, uh, when it is church and state, any time the Roman Empire has, you know, look at, look what happened with Luther after the Diet of Worms when they brought him and tried to make him recant. When he was, the only reason he got out of there is because of all those princes that were there and he had Frederick III was kind of like his benefactor. And as he was leaving, Frederick III basically snatched him up and took him away to a castle where Luther actually was one of the first. He took the Bible and translated into German so that, it, so that the local people, I mean the people of his country, could have a Bible. And he did marvelous things. But, and Luther lived what, to be nine? How old was Luther when he died? I'm not sure, but he, he didn't die. He didn't die at the stake. Yeah, you know, he, he wasn't didn't, burned he, up. God protected him all throughout his life. He actually married a ex yeah, he, nun right. and had children, and so right. he did. God he quite did protect him. And, and you know, again, uh, there's been more books written about Martin Luther than any other human being on the planet, other than Jesus Christ. So we're talking about uh, a major historical figure. We're talking about the Reformation, which was a, uh, a very powerful move of God, and and. Europe was Catholic, Luther was Catholic. He wanted to reform the church uh, as a Catholic when he was opposed by Pope Leo. He finally studied the prophecies and realized that this power is fulfilling prophecy uh, and it's doing what, what Daniel 7 says it would do, the little horn making war on the saints, Second Thessalonians 2 exalting itself above God. Uh, Revelation 13, the beast that would have global influence and also make war on the saints. Revelation 17, it would be a woman representing a church, drunk with the blood of the saints. And he put all these pieces together. And the fact of history is, and it may be politically incorrect, people may not like me for saying this, but the fact of history is that the Reformation had uh, steam and power because not just of justification by faith and salvation by grace, but it was through its understanding of Bible prophecy. Amen. And that prophecy, those prophecies have been forgotten today. And that's why uh, sincere evangelicals and charismatics and orthodox and messianics are ultimately, I mean, without, I hate to say it, but they're going, they're, they're uh, entering yes, the bed the with the beast. Yeah. And they don't realize what they're doing. And they're walking into a trap. And it is the most loving thing to do to try to open their eyes and to help them to understand what's going on so they can avoid the trap of the beast. And Catholics need to know this too, like those women that I saw climbing up on mm, those stairs, yes. you know, grimacing and, and uh, you know, Catholics need to know that God loves them, that they don't need to make a pilgrimage to Fatima, they don't need to climb up stairs, they don't need to confess to priests, they don't need to uh, pray the rosary so many times a day. They don't, you know, there's, they don't need to try to buy their relatives out of purgatory. There's a whole host of things they don't need to do. They can get on their knees in their bedrooms and open their hearts uh, to Jesus and trust in his love and his grace and his forgiveness and his power. And Jesus himself directly can give them the gift of eternal life and bring peace to their souls. And that's what they need. That's what Catholics need, and that's what Protestants need. And if, if this whole, you know, country and the world is moving toward uh, the final crisis, and as, as these disasters are happening left and right, these are all indications of the signs of the times that God is uh, withdrawing his spirit, and he's allowing these cataclysmic things in nature to take place. And I talk about this in my next book that's almost done, uh, Why Deadly Disasters, then we need to know what's going on. We need to know what's going on. And if we are on the edge of the mark of the beast crisis, and if the mark is, is Sunday observance, which is a mark and a sign of the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and if uh, evangelicals and Protestants and Christians, without knowing it, are really submitting to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church beast by keeping Sunday, 
then they need to know about this. And just to clarify, we don't believe that anybody has the mark of the beast right now, but when it's enforced by law and people are enlightened and they have a chance to see the issues, if they continue to go in that direction and keep Sunday uh, and believe it, they get the mark in their foreheads. If they don't believe it, but they go along with it, they get the mark in their hands. And the fourth commandment itself talks about remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy and you remember in your forehead. And then it says, don't work on the seventh day. You don't work with your hands. So the fourth commandment itself deals with the forehead. It deals with the hand. It deals with the issue. And uh, it's time for a reformation. It's time for a reformation back to the Bible. Once again, just like in Europe, uh, back to the Ten Commandments, back to the seventh day Sabbath. And before we're done, we'll see how the cross is still at the center of, uh, of the preaching of the three angels' messages. Amen. Let me just read this before we get into the three angels' messages, because this is what the Bible says. This is what we stand on. This is what Martin Luther stood on. And um, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes this, for by chapter 2 of Ephesians and verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. But then he goes on and says, for we are his workmanship. We are his work of art, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God commanded or, or prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So our works, nothing we can do can save us but when we come into covenant relationship with the Lord, it is, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will give you another comforter and he'll be in you. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit and because of our love of Christ that we walk in the good works, that we walk in the commandments of Christ, not to be saved, but because we are saved. That's right. And Shelley, that balance, that biblical New Testament balance is embedded in the three angels' messages. So let's look at that. We okay. only have a little bit of time left. And let's, uh, let's just, we don't have time to go into every detail of the three angels, but uh, lo and behold, and we all know this, at least those of us that are here, that the Three Angels Broadcasting Network is, is a uh, global television ministry that God has raised up to communicate with un compromising boldness, the messages of the three angels, which are found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. Now, the first angel in verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The first angel's message has the everlasting gospel, which is the gospel that Luther preached. It's the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Amen. It's not through works, it's not through traditions, it's not through anything that comes from man. It's the promise it is, God made to right. Abraham. <laughs> it's Jesus himself. So yes. the first angel has the gospel mm -hmm. that Luther preached. Now then the uh, verse seven talks about with a saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And that last part of verse seven about worshiping him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is a direct quote from the fourth commandment yes, it is. that says for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. So the first angel's call to worship the Creator points right back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, which points to the Sabbath commandment, the seventh day, as a sign of the Creator. Now then, verse 9, verse 8 warns about Babylon, which has to do with all the religious confusion, ultimately centered in the, the woman of Revelation 17, which is a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church system. Uh, that Babylon has fallen and the whole world is drunk with the wine of Babylon, the doctrines of Babylon, uh, the confusing teachings of Babylon that lead away from Scripture, sola scriptura. And then verse 9 says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast. So it's worship of the Creator in verse 7 or worship the beast in verse verse 9. We have a worship issue between the beast and the Creator. And again, the Creator 
worshiping him points to Jesus as our creator and points to the fourth commandment. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a call, it's a warning not to follow the beast. And of course, we have to know who the beast is. Mm -hmm. And 500 years down from Luther, uh, we are saying that the beast is still the beast. It's the same beast that Luther uh, talked about from Revelation 13. Uh, and, and Daniel 7 especially, Daniel and 2 yeah. Thessalonians chapter 2, and that is the beast who has the mark. The that point. beast has the mark, uh, which we've talked about is the observance of a false Sabbath, uh, which goes back to a the Sunday change worship. in history where the Roman Catholic Church changed God's seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week, claims it as a mark, and eventually it'll be enforced by law. And verse 10 and 11 uh, warns about the consequences of getting the mark of the beast, the mm -hmm. deadly uh, eternal consequences. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So verse 12 has the balanced blend and it's describing people who don't get the mark of the beast who don't get the mark. And they do two things. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus and Jesus is the last word of the third angel's message. And I want to clarify that when we look at those 10 commandments here, and let me just briefly go through them. Uh, the first one says that God is to be basically number one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. God is to be first. Number two has to do with idols, not having any idols, don't making, making any graven images or statues and bowing down to them. Number three is not taking the name of the Lord in vain. Number four has to do with keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy. Uh, number five is honor your father and mother, honoring your parents. Number six is you shall not kill or murder. And you and I have talked about that, that, that murder not only applies to killing someone physically, the New Testament says it also yes. applies to hating, hating someone. And uh, we also strongly believe that it also applies to the unborn, that the yeah. murder of, of babies inside their mother's mm -hmm. bodies, and that's a whole other subject. I've written a little book on this called Hidden Holocaust. We've produced a 13-part television mm -hmm. series. Uh, with Antoinette Duck and Diane Wagner. You've interviewed them uh, and their uh, horrific experiences concerning uh, abortion. And, uh, and we believe that, you know, murder is murder and that uh, you're not just a human when you come out, but you are a person when you are inside the body uh, of, of the mother. And the Bible's very clear on this in many, many, many Bible verses and that we need to take a stand for life and for children. Amen. Uh, it's the biggest Amen, Holocaust. Brother. You know, people say that heart disease is the number one cause of death. That's really not true. The number one cause of death is abortion and mm. killing babies, 56 million a year. And we need to be- 56 uh, That's right, around million. the world. Wow. And, and we need to be clear on this and study and understand what's happening. And anyway, we could talk a lot about that, but number seven has to do with not committing adultery. Uh, any form of sexual sin, and we know what's happening in our world today. People are all mixed up about genders and boys and girls and, you know, marriage. And, uh, and then number eight is uh, don't steal. Number nine is don't lie, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10 is don't covet. And uh, Jesus and the Old Testament summarize the Ten Commandments in the two big commandments of loving God and your neighbor as yourself. It's, it's the law of love. And, and, and here's my point. My big point is that uh, 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem, on a cross, the maker of heaven and earth hung, and he took into his mind and into his heart and into his soul the commandment breaking, the Sabbath breaking, the murder, the adultery, the lies, the stealing, the idolatry, the hatred of this whole world of all the sinners from, including me, from Adam to the end of time and he suffered, he agonized, and he paid the price, and he died. Uh, and he did that by grace. It's grace. And salvation is through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. through the everlasting gospel. And when we understand the law and the gospel in their proper relationship as described in the third angel, Revelation 14, 12, we understand that our Creator paid an agonizing price for us. He loves us 
no matter what we've done, uh, no matter how hopeless we feel we are, like I did this past summer, no matter how uh, with much we've struggled, no matter how many, much we've sinned, Jesus paid the price and, and uh, died for us all. And when we, when we see that and believe in that love and that mercy and that forgiveness and give our lives to Him, He forgives us, He saves us by His grace, He comes into our hearts, He writes His law in our hearts. And uh, Summer, if you could put the last slide up there. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said in John 14, 15. The issue of the law of God is not a legalism issue, it's an issue of love. Amen. Love for Jesus because of what He did for us on the cross, and we want to stand for Him. Uh, you know, God is looking for Luther's in these last days. Amen. And we need to stand for Jesus in the Bible. And what, what people have heard tonight may be shocking, but it's, it's the truth. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And uh, the only kind of righteousness that there is, is righteousness by faith. And that is, should be the loud cry of, the, of as we continue the Protestant Reformation is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have something. I've got one quote I'd like to, uh, one quote I'd like to finish with. The famous quote, shouldn't do a program on the Reformation without reading this quote. Uh, before the Diet of Worms, <clears throat> Luther said, before a, an august assembly of uh, the emperor and princes and rulers of Europe, Luther said, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils, because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture, he said, my conscience is bound by the Word of God. I cannot and I will not retract, uh, because it is, it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. A Men. And may God help you, may He help me, may He help all of us to stand for Jesus Christ and for the Word of God. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. You're well, welcome. Uh, we want to do two things right now. Perhaps you would like s either Steve or somebody from Whitehorse Media to come and do an event at your church or maybe at a camp meeting. We want to get their address for it in just a second. But first, I wanted to remind you that there is a special offer tonight, and this is from Whitehorse Media. There are five books uh, celebrating the 500th um, anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, five books for $5, The Vanishing Protestant, The Antichrist Identified, The Coming Judgments of God, Discovering the Lost Sabbath Truth, and Decoding the Mark of the Beast. One thing I like about your books are they are very simple to grasp. You, you lay it out in a very wonderful way. And so put that back up on the screen for just a second, because if you want these books, don't call 3ABN. Go to whitehorsemedia.com or call 1-800-782-4253, because this is from Whitehorse Media. Now, Let's put your address up if you want to get in touch with Steve or anyone at Whitehorse Media. Here's how you may contact them. If you would like to learn more about Whitehorse Media and their efforts to reveal God's light in darkness through radio, television, books, CDs, DVDs, and public seminars, you may visit them online at whitehorsemedia.com. That's whitehorsemedia.com. You may also give them a call at 800-782-4253 or write to them at Whitehorse Media, Post Office Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this hour, uh, two hours, as much as I have. Steve, we just want to thank you so much for being here. The time went by quickly. Do you have a final thought? Well, my final thought is um, praise God. I am so excited to be here. As I mentioned, uh, I had a terrible summer, and Jesus brought me through. He wanted me to be here. He wanted me to share this with you. 
to give you hope that nobody's hopeless. Jesus loves us all. And by his grace, uh, through his mercy, we can stand for the Bible and for uh, the three angels' messages. And that's what this is all about. So may God help us to stand. God's looking for Luther's today. And may we all be like him. Amen and amen, brother. Thank you so You're much welcome. for being here. Our prayer for you is that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you not only today, but always. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.